All right, well, good morning once again, dear saints at home and the faithful that are here too. Of course, just what's required by the recent restrictions to have a live stream service, right? We don't, obviously, we don't have a church full of people. It's kind of odd to stand here and just see a handful. But nevertheless, we're going to open God's Word, and we're going to be instructed and encouraged. So can you folks please open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36. It's an odd place to go in the Bible. You don't, <laughs> I don't know how many pastors are preaching out of 2 Chronicles these days in North America. This message this morning is called The Return, Part 1. How many parts will be in the series? God only knows, but we're going to call this the return part one. Let's remember where we are in Israel's redemptive history. Israel has been taken captive first by Babylon, and then there was a power change. Babylon herself was replaced by the Medo Persian Empire. Let's read why this happened. 2 Chronicles 36, verse 14. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests, and the people transgressed more and more according to all the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of God which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked his messengers, uh, mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. That's what happened. Why were they wrenched from the land of promise? Why were they taken captive? Why were they conquered so decisively and brought across the river over into Babylon? Here's why. Because these people remained disobedient to God, the covenant-keeping, faithful God. They threw his words behind them, they would not hear the prophets. They refused to take seriously his warnings. And God said there was no remedy. See at the end of verse 16, there was no remedy. Now this is, of course, distilled for us in the book of Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1. It says that he who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will be suddenly destroyed and that without remedy. That's what the proverb says. Can I say this? This is a nice verse to have in your hand when your local cultist knocks on the door. You can speak to him through your mask, maybe. You can let him know about Proverbs 29. I mean, I have had many cultists come to my house over the years, and I will open the Bible to these people, and I will show them what the Bible actually says about the gospel and about salvation and about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit and so on, and I will, sh I will show them right black and white in, in print, right in the Bible. And they'll be absolutely refuted, but they just know that they know that they know that they're right. They've got nothing that looks like an intellectual challenge to the things I'm saying. And I'll ask these people, have you ever run into anyone like me who opens the Bible and talks to you and shows you things from the Bible? You know what they'll say to me? Oh, yes, we've talked to many people like you. And then I will give them Proverbs 29.1. Hey, you're being often reproved here. You want to be cut off without remedy? Just keep going like you're going. You see, that is a sobering thought. You might want to share it with cultists. You also might want to share it with professing Christians in the last of days who are not taking God's teachings and his warnings seriously. I mean, we, first of all, better take these things seriously and then share these things with others. But whatever the case, God's covenant people, Israel, they were punished just the way he said they were going to be punished. All the way back to the Mosaic Law. You disobey, you adopt the pagan practices and philosophies, of your neighbors around you, and you keep it up, and God said, I will conquer you. I will send a pagan military power to conquer you, subjugate you, and pull you out of the land of promise. And you're going to learn your lesson. And this is what happened. Three deportations out of the land of promise. And in that first deportation in 605 BC, who was among the captives? Daniel. Now, we've been walking with Daniel, haven't we? This is still very fresh in our minds. Daniel was taken captive yet wrenched out of the land of promise, brought over to Babylon. And you know what? Daniel's life is a wonderful exemplification of something we read also in the Proverbs. Now, this is Proverbs 16 and verse 7, where we're told that if a man's ways please the Lord, 
he will make even his enemies to be at peace with him. Of course, that's a general truth. There are exceptions. We don't claim there aren't exceptions, but as a general truth, if you honor and serve the Lord, you love Jesus, you are going to display to the world, what? A person of integrity, honesty, as someone who's dependable, faithful. And those traits were manifest in a spectacular way in the life of Daniel. And his captors recognized that. And remember, Daniel was elevated to a position of prominence, first in the Babylonian court, and later when Babylon herself was conquered by the Medo Persian Empire, the, the, the Persians said, Daniel, come on board. You, we recognize something in you. We're going to give you great re privileges and responsibilities, Daniel. See, and we can do that even in the last of days. I mean, I don't know how depraved our government is right now, but as God only knows, but you still like to think they want people around who are honest and have some integrity, and, um, and that's the kind of people we want to be. And that's amazing. Now, of course, Daniel, we remember, uh, for his character and faithfulness to God, he was called a man greatly beloved. Remember that? And one of the reasons why was because he had an insatiable appetite for the Word of God. He couldn't get enough. He was searching the Bible constantly. And if that weren't enough, he was asking for special revelation to come to him directly, and God was pleased to give it. Angelic messengers came and talked to Daniel. And because of Daniel's character and his inquisitive nature, his faithfulness, God entrusted to his care astounding prophecies that concern who? Us in the last of days. And if you want to understand what's going to happen at the end of the world, the events which will precede, accompany, and follow the coming of Jesus, you have to mastermind Daniel. And we've tried to do that in the last few weeks. What are the things we learn from Daniel and other writers, even from the lips of Jesus himself, was that the exile had a time limit. And God would work in history to bring his people back to the land of promise. They were not to be obliterated forever. They were not to be sent into exile to the end of time. There was a limit to this. And I want us to read about it. This is now in Ezra. You just flip ahead a couple pages in your Bible to the book of Ezra chapter 1. Just a few pages, depending on which Bible you have. Ezra 1. Ezra, the priest and scribe has some things to tell us. Now let's look at Ezra 1, verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, Thus says Cyrus king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, he is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of, this, of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God which is in Jerusalem, then the heads of the fathers' houses of, of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all whose spirits God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. You see God working in history here to accomplish his plans and purposes. This is very clearly laid out for us in the Bible. God is in charge here. Even though Cyrus the Persian said, okay, you Jews, go back home, the whole thing, the whole enterprise was ordained of God. This was all in the plan of God. This was revealed to Jeremiah the prophet in the 29th chapter of his prophecy, 70 years in Babylon, that's it. And Daniel rejoiced in that. Remember, Daniel was consulting Jeremiah. It's sort of like the great tribulation period that we were contemplating in previous weeks. Three and a half years, 1,260 days of great tribulation. Jesus said it'll be more horrible than any other time block in earth history. Yes, but there's a limit. God says there is a limit. Satan doesn't just take over the world forever. Satan doesn't get the last word. Demons don't get the last word. Unregenerate, fallen, wicked men, government systems don't get the last word. Christ gets the last word. And he says there's a time limit 
to evil on this planet. Don't you need to hear that? I need to hear that. Can I say this? This is a personal word now. Your own personal trials have a limit too. I know you're dealing with hard things. We are too in, in my family. We all are. Uh, Paul says if you suffer with Jesus, you may be sure you will be glorified together with him too. In Romans 8, there is a limit to the nature of whatever it is that's harassing you and harming you, and there is a time limit also. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, but God won't give you more than you can bear, and with the temptation comes a way of escape. That's what our faithful God told us. There's a limit to these things. Paul himself in 2 Corinthians 4:17 uh, spoke about his own trials and tribulations and pressures placed upon him. Was Paul's life easy? No way, Jose. <laughs> Paul's life was hard. You read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12. Hard. His life is what we might say admirable, but not enviable. How many of us would like, love to try to bear up under the pressures that Paul had to bear up under? And you know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4? He spoke of his trials and challenges as light and momentary. And he tried to compare that with the eternal weight of glory. And he said, it doesn't even go on the scale. It doesn't tip the scale, not one bit. Compared to what is in reserve, res there for you, promised to God's people. Light and momentary, says Paul. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, he said, it is a righteous thing with God to give all you who are troubled rest. Hebrews 4, 9 says there remains a rest for the people of God. We're feeling a bit of it now, aren't we, in the Western world? We've had a few decades of reprieve, but now it's coming. God says, don't you worry. He is going to trouble those that trouble you one day. Kiss the sun. Be instructed, you kings of the earth lest his wrath be kindled but a little and you perish in the way. That's a warning for all of us, especially the leaders. So be patient, saints. These things are under control. Now, how did God do it? Well, here, uh, God stirred up the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia. Cyrus said, okay, you Jews, go home and build your temple. And he issued a decree. By the way, archaeologists have discovered that decree. I think it's in the British Museum right now. Weird looking thing, this big clay thing. It looks like a cob of corn. <laughs> it has all kinds of cuneiform script, but that is the Cyrus cylinder. It's been found. And he said, You go back and you build your temple, and I want you to pray for me and my sons. It's hard to know if Cyrus was a real believer, but he, in any case, he said, Well, I want everyone who worships any kind of God to worship their God and pray for me. So if the God of the Jews isn't the real God, well, I've got some other guy in, res in reserve. And, and sooner or later, we're going to hit the true God. And he's going he's to bless me and my sons. But this is how God works in history. Sort of like how God prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Remember that? Micah 5? How did he do it? Well, he just had Caesar, Augustus, issue a decree. We're going to tax the world. You must go to your place of origin. And there was big pregnant Mary... <laughs> riding on a donkey all the way back to Bethlehem with her husband. See, that's, God works in history. And what's positively astounding in all this is that 200 years before Cyrus, God spoke through his special prophet Isaiah. And we're not going go to go the, to the verses, but you can consult the end of Isaiah 44 and the beginning of Isaiah 45. And who is named by name there? Cyrus. He's called God's anointed. And he says, my man Cyrus, my anointed, is going to build my temple. The temple hadn't even been destroyed yet. This is 700 plus B.C. when the, when the prophecy was uttered. God knew Cyrus by name, and he had some good works in store for that guy to walk in. Guess what? He knew, he knew our names before we were born, too. And he's put some good works before us that we should walk in. Can I say it? In the last of days it's going to require some real courage to walk in those good works because there's a world out there that doesn't want you to and the pressure is mounting. You say, God, give us courage, give us strength. Well, what happened here? Three 
deportations, three waves of exiles pulled from the Holy Land. Guess what? When they began to return, they returned in three waves. And in Ezra chapter 2, you start, you read here, you begin to read about the first wave of returnees. And uh, these guys came back under Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor. These two guys are leading the charge back. And the, what, one of the things we notice here in verse 2, now I'm in chapter 2, verse 2, look at verse 2. Those who came with Zerubbabel were Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Realiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvi, Reham, Bena, and the number, of the, pe- the number of the men of the people of Israel, the number of Parash, 2,172, the people of Shepathiah, 372, and if I just keep reading, I'm going to lose my entire internet audience. Uh, why, oh why, such precise numbers? You just peruse, just let your eye keep going there in the chapter, chapter 2, why such precise numbers? I think number one, so you can be sure this is not fiction. Fiction doesn't read like this. Somebody has carefully researched, cataloged, recorded all this data. This is not once upon a time. This is real historical data. Second of all, this is God reminding you and me that He overlooks nobody. See, the individuals matter to God. The numbers matter to God. All are recognized. All are accounted for. Everyone's provided for. That's how God operates. That is so unlike human beings. Man regularly overlooks, underestimates, ignores other people according to his own subjective perspectives and opinions. We look down on each other. We look down on people on the street. We think we have their story all figured out. We know nothing. God doesn't do that to people. God doesn't operate like that. In fact, we are a little shocked, I think, to find out that God deliberately chooses for service the marginalized, the underestimated, the overlooked, those who this satanically dominated world looks at and doesn't see too much. God says, oh, as a matter of fact, that's the one I've chosen to do some amazing work for me that has eternal cosmic significance. See, that's how God works. He's surprising. God is very surprising. You must consult his Bible to understand God. You'll never figure him out any other way. And even with his special revelation, he's still very surprising to us. Now, just look, please, at chapter 2, verse 59. And we're really going to get to the heart of the message here. Chapter 2, verse 59. Now, remember, this first wave of returning exiles are uh, religious in nature for the most part. We want to get the sacrificial system up and running, We need the priests and Levites to come back. We need that temple precinct built up again. So that's the flavor of what's happening. 2.59, let's take a look. And these were the ones who came up from Tel Mela, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adam, Emer. But they could not identify their father's house or their genealogy, whether they were of Israel, the sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakota, 652, and of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Koz, and the sons of Berezillai, who took a wife of the daughters of Berezillai, the Gileadite, and was called by their name. These sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled. You see that? You want to function as a priest in God's religious program? All right, you've got to be from the right family. Do you have some objective evidence that you are of the right family? You don't have it, you're out. You cannot function here in this way. Friends, this is a mirror, this is a reflector of a precious New Testament reality. Now we come to our time. Those who are saved in this dispensation are called to function and serve God as what? Priests. We are priests. We are new covenant priests in the present dispensation. But only those who are in God's family can function in that way. 
You cannot be a priest of the Most High God unless you're in His family. Now, how do you get into His family? How does that happen? Well, aren't you glad God tells you? John 1, 12, as many as received Him, Jesus, to them gave He power to be called the sons of God. You receive Jesus on faith. You enter into a love-trust relationship with Jesus, and you are brought into His family. That is absolutely essential. It can't happen any other way. In fact, I can read now from the book of Hebrews chapter 13. I'm just going to read very quickly here from Hebrews 13 and verse uh, 10. Listen to this. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. I wonder if you caught the significance of that. When the writer to the Hebrews penned that letter, the temple in Jerusalem was still functioning. And he says, as a matter of fact, we have a very special privilege here, this household of faith, new covenant priests, believers in Jesus, we have a special privilege that even those priests in all their impressive array, functioning in that impressive temple, the envy of everybody, they have no right to sit down and eat with us at our, at our altar. They can't do it. It doesn't matter how impressive they may be to the eye. It doesn't matter what relationship they may have to the government, and they did. They cannot eat at our, at our altar with us. Why not? Because they're not blood-bought saints of God reconciled to God by the blood of Christ's cross. They don't have that. Therefore, they cannot function as new covenant priests, however impressive they may appear. The Bible says in Romans 8 that we are sons of God. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the sons of God, we are heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. And guess what? If you want to function as a priest, it's going to require some objective evidence, just like in the days of Ezra. We need some objective evidence to show that you are in the family of God. And for this, I turn now to Hebrews again, chapter 2, Hebrews 2. And I want to read these precious verses to you. Hebrews 2.11, and if you want to turn there, you can. But listen, I mean, this is absolutely profound. Uh, this captures my heart like nothing else. This is amazing to me. Hebrews 2.11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren, in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. I want you to stop and think about those verses. It says, he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are of one. Now, what does that mean? The one who is sanctifying is Jesus. Those who are being sanctified, that's us. How can the writer say that we are of one? Well, the, the next few verses that he quotes from the Old Testament make it kind of clear, I think. First of all, we are both submitted to the same ultimate authority, and that is God the Father. We are of one. We are submitted to God the Father. Those verses make it very clear. And secondly, we share the same nature. Mystery of mysteries. The second person of the Blessed Trinity took a human nature. He shares the nature with us. We are of one in that respect also. For which cause he is not ashamed to call us brethren. We're in the family now. We can function as priests. The objective evidence, the testimony of Jesus. You don't need anything more than that, right? <laughs> if Jesus said it, that's good enough. His word is the objective evidence. He's in the family. He can function as a priest. Christ's testimony is the objective evidence that qualifies us to function as a holy and royal priesthood. And that's amazing to me. I still have sin in my flesh. You do too. Nevertheless, I'm still permitted to walk into the presence of a holy God and talk to Him and make requests of Him. The Bible says, yes, you can do it with boldness. Really? Yes, you're in Christ. Your sins are purged. You are in Christ. You approach God on His merits. Come with boldness. Come with joy. 
You've been brought near by the blood of Christ, says Paul. Mystery of mysteries. Don't let these things bounce off of you. Let them sink deep and rejoice in these things. Now, I know what you're thinking. I think I do. I think the same thing. I sure don't feel qualified for this. You ever go outside and look at the stars? Oh, God, you made all that? Your mind is so unfathomable, your power unsearchable. You made all that, and you're holy and blameless and perfect, and you allow a wretch like me to function as a priest? Well, God has some words to speak to this. You ready? This comes from Romans 8, verse 33. Listen to this. A rhetorical question. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. It is God in Christ that qualifies you to function as his special priest, his minister, his ambassador. He qualified you. You've been equipped. You've been qualified. Now let's get busy. The world has never been in a worse condition than it is right now. Today, dear saints, the faithful in Christ Jesus are themselves living stones being placed together by Christ, the wonderful master builder, into a temple, a holy habitation of God in the Spirit. We are both the temple and the priesthood, and we are called to worship and to serve the God who loved us first. And I want to say that worship and service cannot be separated. You can't say you're worshiping God and you don't do anything to serve Him. Impossible. And you can't serve God without truly worshiping Him from the heart. Now, Jesus put those two things together when He confronted Satan in Matthew 4.10. Away with you, Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God only, and Him only shall you serve. Worship without service is vain and it's empty. And service without worship is dead. It's sterile. It's lifeless. You need them both to function as a faithful new covenant priest. Worship and service. Friends, I get so sad sometimes when I read the book of Acts. The church started so strong, so courageous, so bold, so powerful, so ground-taking. Acts chapters 1 to 5 absolute purity in the church. Believers only were added to the church daily. And man, were they courageous. And the officials said, you will stop preaching the name Jesus. You will stop filling the streets of Jerusalem with that name. And Peter said, you judge whether it's better to listen to man or to God. You judge. These men were sprung from prison miraculously. Where are they? Back in the temple preaching. You judge what is better for the child of God to do. As church history progressed, I fear that we've lost our way. I fear that we've been bludgeoned into submission. We allow the opinions and practices of the world to corrupt our thinking. We've grown cold in our love. We've grown cowardly, intimidated, bludgeoned. This can't continue. When Jesus returns, he's coming back for a spotless, courageous, beautiful bride, uncorrupted by the world. This is like serious, because any moment now we're going to hear a trumpet. You're going to hear the voice of an archangel deafening, and you'll see Jesus in the clouds. Do you believe that? It's unlike anything in our experience. We've never seen anything like it. The Bible says, you better believe it. It's going to happen. And immediately following that event comes the judgment seat of Christ, a very, very sober event where you and I will pass before review and we will be called to account for our faithlessness or faithfulness. And you'll be rewarded for what good things you've done in the body, but how many rewards will we miss out on for our lukewarmness? My prayer for the church is that we would start strong and finish strong. And what is that to look like in the last of days? Impossible for me to give you details on this. We need to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. He needs to tell us what to do. I'm not brilliant enough for this, but we need to be praying about this. 
and things got to change. In the present distress, things are going to change. How? It's up to God. But when He tells us, we better be obedient. And if we're not, if we're scared, then we ask Him to help us with that too. And He will. He will. You need some encouragement? Read Hebrews 11. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read the Antinicene Fathers also. This is the heritage of the church. We will suffer with Jesus that we may be glorified together with him. And this is like serious stuff we're talking about, isn't it? Eternal significance to the things we're saying. All right, friends, that is the end of my message from God. I will just pray because if I keep talking, it'll be me. Who wants that? Let's have a prayer. Father God, in Jesus' precious name, we come before you in boldness. We rejoice in so great a salvation. We rejoice in the fact that our Lord Jesus is not far from us, that he loves us, he cherishes the church, he feeds her, sanctifies and cleanses her by the washing of water by the word. Lord, in this hour, we need you. We need you in our country to revive your local assemblies and of course, Lord, we pray especially for this local assembly. We pray that it is not blown apart, that it's not irrecoverable. We pray that you would hold it together, that the bond between saints here would be unbreakable, that our love for you would never grow cold, that you would infuse our hearts with wisdom and power and courage so that the church age finishes strong, so that when we see you in the clouds caught up together with those who have gone before us. We will look at Jesus and we will not be ashamed before him at his coming. Lord, we mean it. These are serious times. We pray that you'll answer this prayer and prayers like it in spectacular fashion for your glory, for the good of your people. In Jesus' name we pray it all. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise our great God. God bless you, saints.